Hello everyone and welcome to Attorney Screening where today we're doing another Hooptober review. This time we're covering Mario Bava's classic Black Sabbath from 1963. Uh, a film that I picked almost exclusively because it is the very film that inspired the band Black Sabbath. You know, one of the greatest bands of all time. Um, True. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a segment set in Birmingham, which would probably, <laughs> although the sort of you know medieval Serbian section probably quite closely resembles Birmingham at yeah, the time. Oh, they're definitely much nicer than Birmingham. <laughs> yeah, probably. Boobs. Boobs, Aussie. These filmmakers are just f***ing boobs. Uh, but anyways, this is a, a classic uh, Italian American production um, that was made. In the around the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of Italian films crossing over, obviously right. with westerns and such, where American studios realised you can make kind of charming and commercially appealing uh, films with Italian filmmakers for very very cheap. Yes. Um, and a lot of these films have now sort of later on had a real sort of retro reevaluation, even though at the time I think this was not seen as a particularly great film. Okay. And adding to the cheapness of this film, of course, is the fact that it's an anthology three part film uh, with three separate stories within it that will go over, um, which allowed them to, I guess, work with a bunch of actors but get the shoots done relatively quickly, I would sure. imagine. Yeah. And so I guess it makes sense to start with the very first section of the film, which is called The Telephone, mm. um, which is essentially a story about a woman who was receiving threatening phone calls um, just before she's trying to go to bed basically and it's probably sort of slightly yellow tinged uh, has a sort of strange jazzy bass soundtrack um, and LGBTQ themes yeah uh, what did you think of that one um, I think it's an interesting tone setter for the anthology I quite liked it in terms of the interplay between characters and stuff it not a huge amount is going on it is very quiet and mm. sort of measured in its pacing you get this kind of opening period of about five to ten minutes where it really is just a woman getting a phone call being like that was weird it's quite it annoying because the phone ringing it's quite agitating. It is quite an agitating hear. sound. It's like it's like a baby crying <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah. It's just that right pitch to kind of like. And I swear, people in movies just let it ring too long. They do, absolutely. They're all rude bastards. Seven days. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's this. Yeah, it kind of opens with this back and forth of like, oh, I'm watching you. Ah, oh, take your dress off. Ah, and then she's like mm. freaking out. So then she finally calls her friend, and it's quickly revealed that her friend is the one sending these. Horrible message. Yeah, well, and also that she is scared of her ex yes, who has who escaped she, from prison. Who she put in prison through her testimony. Right, yeah. But it turns out very quickly that it's actually the um, the, the friend, it's not just a friend, but a lover. Yeah. So there's this sort of lesbian love affair going mm. on. Uh, and there's um, a real chemistry, uh, or at least I, I think that the friend character is portrayed particularly well. I think there's, yeah. a, there's a certain blank slate um, quality to the kind of central yeah. protagonist. She doesn't really have much to do, but the, there's a real sort of sensuality and, and um, uh, charisma that comes mm. through from the friend. And, well, the, uh, and, and through that, a real believable sense of sort of love and romance yeah. between the two of them. I think of the three, this probably has the most intriguing actual storyline. It's still pretty bare bones, mm. uh, but it does sort of at least have uh, a setup, a twist, and then a, a, a kind of payoff towards the end. Obviously, in a sort of gallo esque way, it kind of builds up into something quite violent happening. Um, and but, but I guess this is something that I'm going to come back to throughout is that I did kind of enjoy the vibe yeah, uh, and the atmosphere of this kind of old school. This film isn't really taking itself very seriously. I also no. forgot to mention at the beginning that this film opens and closes with B Boris Karloff um, giving a little speech to the screen talking about, this film is very scary. I hope you're not too scared. The person next to you could be a psycho murderer. Mm. <laughs> Which is very charming and kind of sets the tone that this isn't really taking itself all that seriously. No. Um, and whilst this, this is probably one of the darker segments of the film. Yeah. In fact, all three segments are actually relatively dark, but you kind of get the sense this film has this kind of lightheartedness to it yeah. um, in the way that it's made. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, I didn't think that it was this first section was was great, uh, but it was it was okay. I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I think that the next section's up the ante, but I think it's a good one to start with. Yeah, I think it's quite placed, sort of bottle. Yeah, I like the bottle nature of it all taking place within one apartment. It feels quite claustrophobic, mm. and you it, there is is sort of 
relatively effective with its ability to convey the paranoia of the central character mm. because I know she feels really genuinely fretful and that claustrophobic sort of singular environment really mm. aids all of that. Um, again, as I said, I really loved the performance from the secondary character. And then I don't know if we want to spoil the twist. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The twist being that he actually, in spite of you know her being like uh, her friend being like psych it was it was yeah. me um, she starts to write this letter to confess her love and it, which is narrated simultaneously and then he shows up and then the actual guy <laughs> does end up showing up the guy that she put away in prison and strangles her friend to death mm -hmm. with a pair of tights yeah and then the main woman wakes up after hearing this and stabs him yeah and that's the end. And that's the end. It is kind of quite abrupt, which again goes very much in line with old Italian movies. Um, and I don't know, I guess it didn't leave a huge impression on me, this first se segment. It's a simple, effective story that kind of transpires. Has a neat little twist in the middle. I guess I, d I did really like the twist that it was a, an embittered lesbian lover. I did not see that coming. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but outside of that, I can say it was amazing. No, it. for sure. So moving on to the next section, the next section is set in, um, there's, I think it's like the 19th century Serbia, okay. uh, and it's called the Werdalak, which is actually, I guess, a Serbian term for a vampire, yes. uh, but with a slightly more specific mechanic to it. Yeah. Um, you have this guy who shows up, uh, and he discovers, you know, I guess, his family, uh, and they're talking about how their is it their uncle or their grandfather yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or their someone? Grandfather. Yeah, you know, he's not come back, and he'd gone out hunting a, a Turkish Werdalak, mm. uh, and a Werdalak is essentially a vampire, but specifically a vampire who likes to feast on the blood of someone that he loves. Yeah, um, and I guess inadvertently bought inadvertently kill them yeah uh, what do you think of this section? i thought that, well, i mean this is definitely a step up and i really this this, this also features boris karloff does it not yeah he is the he is the, the, granddad the, the or grandfather or whatever, yeah. yeah and i want well, like I, I liked this spin on the classics or vampire's tale because mm. we just reviewed nosferatu only a few days ago and this was yeah refreshing in its sort of in, in implementing that specific mechanic mm. really kind of uh, took a different take on it. It, yeah. it twists the form of the story massively mm. and uh, yeah make, makes things a lot more unpredictable for a start. For sure. So you're not you're not as kind of like going by the numbers like oh, okay here's our classic Dracula here's this beat here's this beat here's mm. this beat. A, a theme that carries forward from the previous story the telephone is this sense of paranoia because mm -hmm. it's about like. When the so the grandfather does come back, that's kind of it's like quite obvious that he is a word like yeah yeah. But then it's like he's they, like cuddling up with the kid. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. He comes back. He's super pale. Um, I really like the aesthetic of this one as well. Like really sort of frosty, lots sort of fog. Of, uh, yeah, landscape. It's it feels very medieval. Um, and I really like this sort of dynamic that plays out with the family because what you get is a kind of an a knowledge of something awful but a reluctance to accept the truth yeah yeah and so that's that's a really interesting sort of spe specific thing you don't see that much in horror mm. is, is is a kind of a relative acknowledgement of your danger but mm. because of the, the familial attachment you don't want to have to put a stake through a man's heart yeah i mean this must have been one of the more expensive ones to shoot because yeah the sets are a lot more uh you know Grand, extensive yeah. and uh, detailed um, and it's obviously quite an interesting setting that you don't often see, you know, like Eastern European vampires, you know, it, it, you know, in a sort of historical sense, uh, it, it, it was like very different, um, yeah. which I thought was... Because yeah, normally the vampires yeah. come over to... Conquer the new world for the greater glory of the undead. It actually kind of feels like it's set in a, in a larger world, whereas obviously the telephone one is like so contained, which yeah. has its own appeal, but yeah, I yeah. do think that this one... Um, just feels a little bit and the characters feel a little bit more colorful in this one as yeah, well i think yeah. there's just the, the all of the acting in this film none of it i would describe as good how rude <laughs> uh, passable is yeah kind of, whereas yeah. this one kind of i feel like the slightly cartoonish acting uh, really suits the setting yeah. as opposed to uh, feeling a little bit more goofy as it does in the previous one and the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, Boris Karloff sort of suiting this part down to the ground. He's yeah, a very definitely. Good, yeah. Very good physical actor, and he, yeah, he, the way he carries himself is very charismatic. And, yeah, he is. But he's he's got like this real kind of uncanny way of mm. kind of holding himself that feels yeah uh, inhuman in some, <laughs> but in, in in really subtle and specific ways. It's mm. not so dramatic. 
uh, as you may expect. And so that again, that enhances that sort of question in the back of your mind. You're like, he probably is, but is he? Or is he just a fucking weirdo? <laughs> um, and there's like the really sinister bit where he asks for the dog to be killed. He's like, the dog yeah. keeps barking, kill it. And I, I do particularly like the scene where he's like being really friendly with the kid and the guys that like, they're, they're kind of said they're like, <laughs> I think he might be a fucking vampire. <laughs> Because it's like set up and then he immediately comes back and starts being really nice. So it's like really blatant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, and then, as you may imagine, it ends with um, it all going horribly wrong and him, mm -hmm. yeah. They like ride off on horses. Then they kill him. The, the way it transpires is that um, Boris Karloff is essentially sort of in getting so sort of um, Cozying up to the grandkid is mm. sort of uses his, I, don't, I guess, like hypnotic energy to convince the kid to um, uh, go off and, and sort of go, uh, and, into, and the night. into the night and, and be joined with him. And then his mother is inconsolable with grief, thinking that he's dead. And then she thinks she, she sees him later that mm -hmm. evening and she's like, Oh, I've got to let he's him like, back don't in. Don't be stupid. <laughs> yeah, and then the sort of hypnotic energy sort of carries over, and she, uh, in her, I guess, sort of grief. Again, hysteria. Has, her hysteria, yeah. that's a great way of putting it. Um, stabs her own husband mm -hmm. to let her child in, and then when she lets the child in, it's <laughs> Boris Karlov. And Boris Karlov, you know, does, I hate it when that happens. does what he does. Uh, and so, and then it's, so three of the family unit are already binned off mm -hmm. and then you have uh, our main character who's sort of tertiary to the actual family who falls in love with like, mm -hmm. the the beautiful blonde sister yep. the uh that they have the, the the golden glow effect on her <laughs> every time she's on screen but debbie what pastels um yeah, I mean, the romance element of this storyline is very much feels obligatory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like, oh, like, like, the main character just kind of shows up and is like a witness to all of the main story stuff happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he's like, oh, a beautiful woman. I must, I must have her. <laughs> I'm in love. I'm in love. Uh, which is, you know, not great when given that the whole thing of the word you like is it kills people that you love. Yeah. So they go off into the night to find the family, find Boris Karloff and kill him. Uh, but in the process, the woman gets got. Yeah. In a way, I think this one feels way more of its own thing. It feels very distinct to the telephone one. It doesn't feel like totally out of place though, because I think thematically a lot of stuff carries over to this one. Yeah. But it feels a lot more fleshed out. And I think this one is like significantly longer as well. Yes, I could be mistaken, is, yeah. but you get a lot more time with the characters. Um, and it does feel a bit more fleshed out. Again, everything is very caricaturish, uh, like the acting. It's is a all, bit pantomime. Yeah, but that's kind of been the vibe from the. It's get -go, part of the yeah. charm for yeah. sure. Um, I guess it never quite ascends to the, uh, you know, transcends its its reality of yeah. being a what is quite clearly a cheap horror film. Yeah, like a pulpy piece. Exactly. Of yeah. But it. It's you know basically an effective mini story. Yeah, and you know what I'd like to see in a more kind of uh, perhaps a more modern and refined context this version of the vampire. Yeah, story the word being, like the concept is really. It's really, really interesting, interesting yeah. and it does play out in a very satisfying way. There's a lot you could do with it. For this sure. for sure, but yeah, I, I I'm pretty much in agreement with you that this is a step up from the telephone, but it lacks the something to mm. elevate it beyond that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, then we move on to the last one. So the final one is called the Drop of Water, which com comparatively to the previous two, I think, is way less intensive on actual narrative and is more focused on the atmosphere of for it. For sure, um, and the the general uh, haunted vibe, if you yes. like. Um, it's way more explicitly supernatural than previous. Obviously, the last one had vampires, but I don't. Uh, vampires are only kind of vaguely supernatural to me. It's like within the universe they exist in, they're just kind of a physical presence. Right? Yeah. There's like a kind of magic element to them with the psychic stuff, but I for guess, the most part. Yeah, I mean, I know vampires do cross into supernatural, but here we're talking ghosts. Yeah, yeah. This is like a, a ghost story, yeah. exactly. Whereas the first one is actually basically just a straight, yeah, it's just like a, crime, yeah, basically. Crime thriller, yeah. yeah. Uh, Whereas this one, essentially you have a, a, a woman who's embalming a body or something like that. You have this absolutely hideous corpse yes. with this bizarre mask that just looks, it's on that weird little old film borderline of looking hilarious yeah. or 
just genuinely quite Completely horrifying. Completely horrifying, yeah. yeah. Which I do really I like. I think it tips over into horrifying, <laughs> for sure. absolutely disgusting yeah. to look at. Um, and she steals a ring uh, from this corpse uh, and goes back to her apartment where very spooky goings on happen. Yes. What did you think of this one? This, I think, is my favorite. I would agree, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely love the atmosphere of this one and I particularly love the set designs. The set was amazing. Yeah, so you've got like these two key sets. The one is the where the room in which the woman died, mm -hmm. and like the her sort of the extended house that you kind of get to see through certain bits, which is quite sort of old fashioned, mm. very sort of uh, period. Um, mm. I don't exactly know what you call it, it yeah. but like it feels very old fashioned. Then and you have the woman's apartment, the woman who stole the ring, and that's much more modern. Mm. You can see like lights outside the window. The lighting that, is really good. Yeah, this, yeah, I think they're like, is there some like neon outside that's kind There's of like colouring? There's like colours on the walls. And yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. light is like really strangely projected up on the exactly, wall. Exactly, yeah. yeah, and it yeah, it feels like she's at like sort of the top suite of like a small block of mm. flats or something. It's and it kind of has a, a much more modern for the time vibe, and I really love those con that contrasting sort of two sets. Mm. It, I don't know, it has a really sort of specific energy to it that I loved, uh, and the the haunting process. It is quite sort of Twilight Zone esque, and it's yeah. kind of like it's essentially her own guilt about a it situation. It has that moral component to it where she has committed a wrong and must suffer the consequences. Exactly that. Uh, in, you know, in some ways, um, there was a vague feeling of like a, a Japanese quality to yeah, it. It reminded like, me a little bit of Quiet Anne. Yeah, I was like, thinking particularly that. maybe even that like weird last segment of Quiet Anne. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, yeah, Where absolutely. Where you have those sort of vengeful ghosts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I was, I, yeah. I just some and also just something about this whole like the, the, the dripping tap and perhaps that. And it's like more. a fly as well. There's like a fly that's like bugging her. Yeah, it, yeah, like, yeah. it starts oh, when she steals the ring, and yes. then when she's in the apartment, she... and it lands, it lands on the place on the woman's mm. hand where the ring was, and it's like it's almost yeah. like that's kind of. I like the ambiguity symbolic. of this one. I assume that it's based on some real folklore or real ghost story or it whatever. It feels like that. Yeah, like that is a, like a, a pre-existing thing. Yes, um, which I enjoyed because um, there's a real ambiguity to this one, which I think maybe the other two. When you're on like a low budget like this and you want to have like a really tight storyline, it's going to be really hard to, for example, like with the word of lack one, it's hard for me to get too invested in the characters because they're obviously not brilliantly acted yeah. uh, and you've only got so much time, especially in an anthology film, to flesh them out anyways. So I kind of enjoyed the pure, uh, the actual kind of spookiness of this one versus the other two because you, it was all about creating the atmosphere yeah. as opposed to you know, having the mechanics of the story build suspense because the directing in this film isn't all of all that, to be honest. It's no. like, it's well assembled. It's not badly directed by I, any means. I think the mise-en-scene is more important here than the actual yes, sort of cinematography exactly, yeah. and directing therein. For yeah. sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm completely with you. Like the, the, I don't know, there was just something so specific about that drip, the, the, the dripping tap and like mm. this kind of being kind of constantly reminded of what you've done. And then the reveal at the end of like the ghost in the bed like yeah. the old woman sort of And then when the police her. come and find her body, the ring is gone and it's like, ooh, what happened? Yeah, who nicked it? <laughs> yeah, but I think what happens at that end bit is not that the, the ring, it, the ring does disappear, but then mm. the fly lands on someone else's Yeah, the else's fly's still hand. buzzing about, yeah, yeah. No, but it's implying that it's like someone, like... Oh, right, the curse continues. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. someone else, like one of the housekeepers who right. got to the body first found the ring. Yeah. It's like, well, maybe this sort of strange compulsion, I guess, it's talking of Japanese horror, the ring, Right. Oh wow, yeah. And the whole thing of the ring <laughs> is that it's a passed on thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like you have to pass on the video to Oh, interesting. And it's the ring on her finger that oh, pe wow. there, people have this bizarre compulsion to keep stealing. Yeah. And it's the curse keeps following on each person. Oh, that that's kills. interesting. I didn't even think of that. Wow, that's a that's a really interesting one. I guess maybe we'll have to do some research into this and figure out what the hell's going on there. Maybe this is some like shared folklore, maybe yeah. this is taken from a Japanese piece of folklore, maybe the ring was I don't know, I have no yeah. idea, but that's really interesting. But yeah, I totally agree. I think this is by far, it's the spookiest. Yep. Uh, and it's, because it's way less reliant on 
the the main woman being like a great actor. Yeah, or, yeah, because it's all physical. Yeah. It's and all she just barely like... really interacts with anyone, so it's really just more about her being in the room yeah. uh, and being spooked out by all these kind of crazy goings on. It, it focuses the film in other areas, which makes it much more effective. Yeah, yeah, and I bet it was fucking dog cheap. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, you probably don't need any diegetic noise from the set, so you can just have the director go, Walk to the door. <laughs> look scared. There is no diegetic good. sound in any of these films. Oh yeah, that, well, that's actually yeah, yeah. that's very true. Yeah, but right. um, that's, yeah, yeah. And then that pretty much wraps up the film. You do also have an excellent outro by Boris Karloff saying, you know, "Yes, I hope you like the film." And he's riding a fake horse. Yeah, yeah, I love that. They pan <laughs> out. He's like riding a horse, and then you pan out, and then you see him on the set, like on the fake horse. And it's like, like a weirdly like meta ending. Yeah, 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 very a charming. Bit of a Blazing Saddles esque vibe to that. Yeah, bit, yeah. Where you know breaking onto the sets of films. And that just kind of wraps it up. It is like very light hearted. Um, what What did you think of it overall? I enjoyed it overall. I think there's a sort of really fun. Um, nonchalant atmosphere to mm. it. It, it, it like we said at the beginning it, it doesn't take itself too seriously it feels like a filmmaker just kind of I don't know assembling some things that they found mm. interesting and and it's, it's it's got that kind of appeal of like a curio like something you discover at the bottom of like a basket like in years to come mm. it's not it's not that it kind of um, has to be watched but it's just that it's it's this sort of really pleasantly sort of charming experience when you do come across mm. it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I basically agree with you. It has that real B-movie charm to it. I could totally imagine being in the 70s, 60s, whatever, sat in a cinema full of cigarette smoke at like <laughs> 3 a.m., you know, drinking a beer uh, and watching this and having a great time or, you know, whatever. However, that's the, it kind of evokes that. It, uh, I, I do feel transported back yeah, in time. Yeah, it feels like that, yeah. like a, like a it really feels like a vintage film. It, it, yeah, it's a lot of the time films that last uh, the best and then sort of survive onwards into mm. into the future that we look back upon now are ones that we call timeless, right? Yeah. Things that, you know, stand head and shoulders and kind of don't tie themselves too specifically to an era. Right, yeah. This is the opposite of that, and yeah. I love it for that. Yeah, well, I would, I, I did honestly find myself losing, my, losing patience with it a fair amount. I don't think it's like the best paced film, and I do think it's limitations. Um, you know, as often as they are charming, can also be grating. Okay. Uh, personally, uh, I didn't love the film overall, uh, but I did still sort of largely enjoy it. I just, I, it is a bit old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah, makes no, sense. It and and, is. and and you know, that's no, you know, obviously we've reviewed like Haxon. Uh, and we've reviewed plenty of yeah, very fucking and old like films. like really yeah. old films that you know are really great and that we love like cat people as well. But it's like I was saying, it's like it, there's films that feel entrenched in their era and films yes, that feel yeah. like they extend beyond it. Yeah, exactly. And this doesn't extend beyond this it. This feels much older than cat people yeah. in a way. Yeah, because me. it feels like it never left 1963. Yeah, exactly. And so as a time capsule film, I did really uh, appreciate it and found it very interesting on a lot of levels. Um, and the fact that it clearly doesn't take itself too seriously obviously added a level, level of levity that made it like very watchable and enjoyable and uh, had a sense of fun to it um, but I wouldn't call it like a like a like a like a must see or no no like I wouldn't what say would, that what would you rate it I'd give it like a six out of ten I think yeah I think I'm sort of on the same page as you maybe a five sort of depending but okay yeah like between a five and a six that's I think. fair that's where I'm at. but yeah I like I, I would definitely not say this is essential viewing but mm. I would say that if you it's one of those ones that you come across as like a curio and you would have a good time watching yeah. it but it's you know, if you are if you're a horror completionist, yeah. this is a fun one yeah, to you add to your see collection. If you're a horror completionist, but yeah. if your enjoyment of horror is more sort of fleeting and kind of you want to spend your time focusing on like the hits or like mm -hmm. the kind of the, the best the genre has to yeah, offer. Or yeah, or like unseen gems that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. This isn't that. No. This yeah. is just a diverting little trip back in time. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so that's our thoughts on Black Sabbath. If you've seen Black Sabbath, let us know what you think about it in the comments. Uh, if you like this review, give this review a like. If you dislike this review, give this review a dislike. And if you want to see the rest of our Hooptober content that is coming out shortly, subscribe to the channel and you will see all of that amazing Hooptober content. Plus, you know, coming up, you know, James Bond, all the normal stuff. But anyways, uh, we've been totally screening and we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace. Huge.